you said that there were dead bodies and all that. Did you have to do any of that kind of work? No, 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 no. Uh, by the time I got there, I, I say that too, just because when we get to these aldeas, these places where these people live, there are hills of just crosses and the kind of, kind of oh, makeshift cemeteries on properties. Wow. That's what I meant by like the visible, you know, bodies okay. for that, in that sense. But yeah. Wow. That must be something else. Just walking through that. Mm -hmm. What goes through your mind when you're walking through a community and that's been devastated like that? And it makes you wonder um, how desolate they might be, how alone they might feel, how abandoned they might feel uh -huh. and be. And then it was also rewarding and surprising to get to their homes because we did a lot of like prayers with them and like home visits of sorts, right? We brought communion with to the people who were homebound, uh, visited with people who were still speaking speaking and practicing in their native tongues and in, in, in their indigenous ways, but were working on going through some kind of RCIA program where uh -huh. they wanted to convert to Catholicism. And so arriving at their homes, you know, it's like one light bulb, maybe. It's a, it, it's a dirt floor and they have like one little cot or bed and everyone's there. Grandma, all the kids, the wow. wife, and if the husband's gone either because of work or he's deceased, then uh -huh. the 15 year old kid is the man of the house. He's the one that's yeah. taking charge. And what was beautiful is realizing even in that appearance of desolation and abandonment, they had a small little table with a white cloth and an altar basically wow. with all their images and the candles because they, they knew the priest was coming you're giving me goosebumps yeah <laughs> i'll tell you that wow Do, so i'm sure when you when you arrived they were like you know when 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 the missionaries started coming mm -hmm. they were like we're so glad you're here we've been waiting for you yeah and they were very thrilled um and so the one of the first things we did too was how can we help you what do you guys need you know because obviously that's it's not just the mission of presence because we were building back relationships, right? But it's like, uh -huh. how can we help you foster what you're already doing? Well, we need more Bibles. Great. We need catechisms. We'll bring them. Uh -huh. So even us as missionaries, we would only like have a backpack on us, right? It's it's, yes. it's the carry-on. Yes. What, what, got, what got checked in was like just this action packer, big crate thing. Uh -huh. And that would have all of our supplies for them. Okay. So you, you head off there first, see what they need, and then Correct. come back. Now, did you ever have the opposite of what I described of a reaction, like people who are mad? How could God let something like this happen to us? Did you have any of those type of reactions when you arrived? Um, not that I've experienced directly, no. I think there was a lot of just, they would probably see us and just, they would just cry. And I think that was the mixture of anger, sadness, and hopefulness just all blended in. Uh -huh. It was beautiful. Wow. How long were you there? Uh, usually a week. Okay. Yeah. And how many people were you with when you? It started off small, maybe 15, 17, and then it grew to about 25. I think the biggest group we had was closer to 30. And that included young adults at that time too. Like at the beginning, it was just kind of, you know, those who could travel, the, the older folks. And then uh -huh. eventually we ended up getting, attracting a lot of great youth to come to this, which was nice and rewarding to see. So you were 18 or 19 at that mm -hmm. time. That must, that was, I'm sure, a huge, huge influence on you. Did you come back thinking, okay, I'm going to become a priest? Yeah. Um, so yes, to answer that, that question. But the irony, so every night we did uh, faith sharing or like, you know, so unpack the day kind of thing. And so in one of those prayer sessions at the end of the day, we, my prayer partner who was next to me said to me, you know, I really see, what did she say? She said, I really see the wounds of Christ in you. Mm. And I think you could carry those in a very particular way as a priest. I think people were just seeing this really energetic, you know, filled with fire for the faith. And they uh -huh. wanted me to like be this priest. And so this, I took it with a grain of salt even then, although it was very beautiful to hear. Um, and then I remember coming back after the fact and t telling some more people about it, people that I trusted, you know. And they also affirmed it. And they said, well, if nothing else, just go talk to the vocations director, who is actually for the dad. Yes, at go the time. <laughs> right, at the time. Go talk to him. And almost like, in a way, I said, yeah, I will do that. That way he can tell me, you just come back from a holy high, a great, beautiful experience. Uh -huh. Live out your Catholic faith a little longer. Okay. And so remember, you're thinking that uh, maybe it was, you were just <clears> on a high <throat> from that trip. Is that what you were thinking? That maybe it's just because I'm on a high, maybe I'm really not made to be a priest? I think Is in that... the back of my mind, that's what I wanted to believe. But okay. I, I, I think I did really experience something different. So you were a little bit in denial, I guess. A little huh? bit, because I knew that it came with a commitment, the commitment of letting <laughs> go and of God daring to say yes back to me. So I didn't want that.